before I do that, let me first of all tell you what smooth analysis is about. So and this is motivated by the following observation. So I think by now uh, there are quite a few problems in optimization that seem to be very well understood complexity-wise. So for example, if you think about linear programming, to give you one example, then of course we all know that we can solve linear programs in polynomial time by the ellipsoid method or interior point methods. So, of course, there are lots of questions open related to linear programming, but let's say from a complexity theoretic point of view, the situation is pretty much clear. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, you have NP-hard problems. You have classical problems like the knapsack problem. Which I will always abbreviate in this talk by KP. And um, you have problems like the PSP. Um, and of course, we all know that these problems are NP-hard, so the TSP is even NP-hard in the strong sense, so we cannot hope for algorithms that solve these problems efficiently um, in polynomial time. However, uh, even though these problems seem very well understood, um, there's actually a problem if you want to solve these problems in applications or if you do some experiments, because then it turns out that very often our theoretic results are somewhat misleading. So for example, if you think about linear programming, theory would predict don't use the simplex algorithm. It's an exponential time algorithm, at least for most pivot rules this is known. But even, even though this is the case, in practice it works quite well. So for the knapsack problem, we can say that's probably one of the easiest problems you can encounter in practice. Uh, so if you create random instances or you take some instances from some applications, then you will see that you can solve these instances really quickly, uh, optimally. So to give you a feeling for that, uh, so if you create random knapsack instances with, say, 30 millions of items, you can solve them within few seconds optimally. So which is quite good for an NP-hard problem, I think. Uh, so in that sense, uh, even though theory predicts it's NP-hard, it's one of the simplest problems you can encounter. And uh, yeah, for this TSP, I think this, the situation is somewhat similar. I think solving the TSP optimally is still a bit harder than solving the knapsack problem optimally. But at least there are lots of heuristics for the TSP, like local search heuristics, where theory predicts these algorithms are pretty much useless. They have a horrible approximation guarantee. But if you run them in experiments, they give you quite good results. So my point is that our classical worst case theory is not able to, to predict in all these cases uh, uh, what will happen if you do experiments or if you run your algorithms on real data. And uh, so the idea of smooth analysis is to go away from this worst case perspective. I mean, the reason for this discrepancy between theory and practice is, of course, that we focus only on the worst case, right? So consider, for example, the simplex algorithm. We say it's an exponential time algorithm since we can construct some linear programs on which it needs an exponential number of steps. But um, that's, of course, too pessimistic because for some reasons these linear programs do not occur in applications. So somehow we have to go away from this worst case perspective. And uh, the idea of smooth analysis is to consider the behavior of algorithms on uh, inputs that are to some extent random. So we go a little bit away from this worst case and assume that some parts of the input are random. And uh, I will tell you what that means in more detail, but uh, I think now I can already start talking about the knapsack problem. So I think this week in the second and third talk, I will also talk about linear programming and maybe the TSP, but today I will focus on the knapsack problem. So. Before I talk about probabilistic analysis or random inputs, let me first of all present you one algorithm to solve the knapsack problem optimally. Um, and this algorithm is, oh, maybe before I do that, let me introduce my notation. I guess you have seen most of that 
yesterday already, but there will be a big difference to yesterday's talk. Instead of rewards, I will talk about profits. So uh, I'm simply used to do that, so I thought about switching to rewards, but I thought that might not end well if I... Uh, I've been talking about profits for more than 10 years, so if I switch to uh, 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 an other notation today, I will probably explain it anyway. So I will talk about profits, and that's what we want to maximize. And of course, we are given weights, so we are given our constraint that the weight must not exceed the capacity, and these xi are simply binary variables. Yeah, so that's the knapsack problem that I'm going to study today. And in order to solve it, um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, and in order to solve it, there are multiple algorithms, and I will uh, present you one algorithm that has been developed by Niemhauser and Ullmann in uh, 69. So it's a quite old algorithm, and it's an algorithm that solves the knapsack problem optimally. Um, and it's based on dynamic programming, but it's not the usual dynamic program that you might uh, have seen already in, in various lectures. Uh, um, I mean, of course, there are dynamic programs that uh, basically have a polynomial running time where the polynomial is bounded in the largest profit or the largest weight, but uh, I'm not going to talk about those uh, dynamic programs. This is a different one. Um, and in order to introduce this, let me first of all give you one definition. Uh, namely, what I will need is the notion of domination and Pareto optimal. So let's say I have two solutions for the knapsack problem. And when I say solution, I simply mean a 0, 1, n vector. So I don't really care if it's feasible or not. So when I say solution, I simply mean such a vector. And let's say I have such a vector y, and I say that it dominates another solution, x, if uh, the profit of y is at least the profit of x, and the weight of y is at most the weight of x, and if at least one of these inequalities is strict. Okay, so that's what I call uh, domination. And then I say that a solution is Pareto optimal, if it is not dominated by any other solution. Um, and, um, okay, that is first of all just the definition. And now the crucial lemma for the correctness of the algorithm is the following. Um, the lemma simply says, um, when I want to find an optimal solution for the knapsack problem, it suffices to look only at the Pareto optimal solution. Or to put it differently, there always exists uh, an optimal solution that is, always that is also Pareto optimal. So let me give you a proof by picture. So and you will see the following kind of picture quite often today. Uh, so we'll put on the x-axis the weight, on the y-axis the profit, and now I will basically uh, put a dot in here for every solution that I have. So uh, I have the solution that does not contain any item, it has zero weight, zero profit, and then I have all the other possible solutions. So I put two to the n different dots in this picture. And each of them corresponds to one solution. And then 
I might have uh, the capacity here, for example. Um, and now I said, okay, what is in this picture the optimal solution? It's clearly this one. Um, to make it a bit more interesting, let's say, I have two solutions that are both optimal. And my claim is that at least one of them must be Pareto optimal. And basically, this is the optimal solution with the smallest weight. Since Pareto optimal means uh, graphically that this area is empty, right? So there's no solution to, um, with, with smaller weight and larger profit. So this region is empty. And if I take the optimal solution with the smallest weight, then this must be the case. Because uh, there cannot be a solution with strictly larger profit, because then this wouldn't be optimal. And uh, so, yeah, the solution must be somewhere here, but I've chosen the one with the smallest weight. So um, this means if I know the set of free to optimal solutions, I can easily solve the knapsack problem. Um, yeah, so the whole idea for the algorithm is uh, that we compute the Pareto set, by which I mean the set of Pareto optimal solutions. And I will denote this by P. Um, and then once I have computed the set, uh, my output is X star. And X star is simply, well, I look at all solutions in this Pareto set. And I take the solution with maximum profit among all solutions whose weight is at most w, right? So once I know p, I can easily compute this quantity, and this is the optimal solution for the knapsack problem. So the only thing that remains is to compute the set p more or less efficiently. And uh, this is what we do by dynamic programming. Um, Uh, how do we do that? What are the subproblems that we solve? Well, basically, the subproblems that we solve um, are indexed by i, where i goes from 0 to n. And basically, in subproblem i, only the first i items are available. Yeah? So I denote by, whoops, by pi, I denote the Pareto set. of the instance that consists only of the first i items. And then I add the items one after another to the instance, and I will always update this pi. Okay, so um, so my encoding will be the following. So formally, you might say that pi is maybe a subset of zero, one uh, to the i, since only the first i items are available. But I will actually encode it as a subset of zero, one to the n, where I set all the bits from i plus one to n to zero. Yeah. So basically, um, yeah, uh, if I have write it this way, it's a subset of all solutions from 0, 1 to the n, where xi plus 1 up to xn equals 0. And then um, I can explicitly write down what p0 is. I don't have any item available, so only the all 0 vector is a feasible solution. Um, I can also explicitly write what p1 is. Well. Basically, I have one item available, and assuming that it has um, strictly positive uh, profit, then both these solutions are pre optimal. Yeah, so basically in the picture, we have here the zero solution, and here we have the solution that contains only uh, the first item, and both are pre optimal. So that's easy. That's our base case. 
And now we have to say how we can compute pi from pi minus 1. So let's say pi minus 1 is known, and somehow we want, want to compute pi. And um, the way we do that is not that hard. So again, we just look at the picture. And let's say we have our set pi minus 1. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I don't. Uh, it's, it's not necessary for the algorithm to do that. Uh, so let's say this is my Pareto set pi minus one. So actually, uh, these marks belong to the set pi minus one. And in order to compute the set um, pi. The first thing I do is I compute a set which I call pi minus 1 plus i, by which I simply mean I take all solutions from this set and I add item i to them. So basically I take all these solutions and I add item i, which means each of these solutions is shifted to the right by the weight of item i and it's shifted up by the profit of i. Yeah? So this solution becomes that. looks like that. So basically what I get is a shifted version of this curve. It's, um, uh, should roughly look like this. Um, yeah, so it's the old curve shifted by wi and pi. I can also write down that formally. Uh, so this contains all solutions x for which there exists a solution y from pi minus 1 such that um, for all j not equal to i, xj equals yj, and yi equals 1. Okay? So I take all solutions here, and to each of them I add i to i. Um, and then we have the following crucial lemma that the Pareto set pi that I'm actually looking for is a subset of pi minus 1 union pi minus 1 plus i. Yeah? So um, I take the union of these sets. Uh, I throw out solutions that are dominated. So in this example, the new Pareto set would look like this. So basically you see that some uh, domination occurs if I put these two sets together. So for example, this solution is dominated by that one, so I don't put it into the next Pareto set. Uh, so I take only those solutions that are not dominated. And that is uh, the set PI that we care about. Um, Maybe, um, yeah, to give you just a very rough pr proof sketch of this, it's not too hard, the statement, but to give you an idea. So let's say I take an arbitrary solution from PI, and then I make a case analysis. So if, um, or if not, X contains item I. So if X does not contain item I, then I claim that x must be in pi minus 1. Because if I have a uh, solution from the previous set pi, which does not contain item i, then it must it be, it was also feasible in the instance before, and it must have been Pareto optimal there as well. Because if it was dominated here, then it would still be dominated in the bigger instance. And uh, if x contains item i, then basically, I look at the solution where I take the vector x and I remove item i. And that's, that must be in pi minus 1. Yeah? Because otherwise, uh, if this solution was dominated, then I take the one that dominates it, I add item i to it, and then I get a solution that dominates x. So this way, um, I have clearly this inclusion here. Um, OK. And this is. Uh, 
now a more or less complete description of the algorithm. I can write it down in pseudocode just for the sake of completeness. Uh, but I think we have seen all the important steps. So first I compute uh, the previous set P0. I can do that explicitly. And then based on PI minus one, I compute PI. And first of all, I compute this superset. I compute QI, which is PI minus one, union PI minus one plus I. And then I say that PI is simply the set of all solutions from QI that are not dominated. Um, yeah, I do this until I found Pn, and then in the last step I, I return my solution X star. As we've seen it, uh, somewhere on top. Okay, <coughs> any questions about this algorithm? So maybe one thing we should discuss, uh, what is the running time of this algorithm? And uh, I would like to express the running time in terms of the sizes of these Pareto sets. And um, one small theorem, or let's say this might be one exercise for today, is to think about how this algorithm can be implemented. And I claim that you can implement it uh, uh, within the following runtime. And the runtime that I claim is linear in the size of these Pareto sets. So basically I claim that in iteration i, uh, the running time of the body of this for loop is linear in the size of pi. Okay? It's, um, I mean, it's not too hard to do that. There are basically two things you have to take care about. Uh, first of all, if you maybe naively implement this, um, then this domination test here takes quadratic time. Since uh, you have, for each solution x, you have to compare it with each solution y, so your running time would be quadratic in the size of this qi. Um, but um, yeah, there's an easy trick to get around that. And the other thing you need to care about if you really implement it is uh, that you shouldn't really store the solutions in these sets because if I copy the solution, this would give me another factor of, of n uh, since, since every solution has a basically encoding length of n bits. So, but you can also get around that. Uh, but uh, maybe not the most interesting thing. So this is uh, the exercise and usually sometimes I teach uh, this algorithm in class and I always uh, say to my students they should really try to implement it since that's very instructive. Um, okay, but uh, for us uh, today, we care more about basically the theoretical properties of this algorithm. And um, well, as you can see already from this running time, the most crucial question is now how many Pareto optimal solutions are there in my instance of the NAPSEC problem that I want to solve? And let's try to study that. Um, First of all, in the worst case. So, any guesses how many Pareto optimal solutions are there in the worst case? <laughs> well, <laughs> essentially, in the worst case, every solution is Pareto optimal, right? So, uh, worst case example is pretty easy to find. Uh, I simply said pi equals wi to q to the i. And then if you look at the corresponding picture, then since uh, the weight equals the profit for every item, 
both solutions are on this line. And since we have chosen them as two to the i, basically each of them has a different weight. So we really get two to the i solutions along this line. So uh, which means in the worst case, uh, this algorithm is here really useless. I mean, in the worst case, it's more efficient to just enumerate all solutions and uh, then find the best one. But um, if you do experiments, then it turns out that usually the number of freed optimum solutions that you observe is much smaller. It's, well, if you do experiments on random inputs, it's a small polynomial usually. And um, yeah, I would like to try to explain this. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the tool that we are using is some kind of probabilistic analysis. So we will go away from this worst case perspective, but go to some perspective where we have some randomness in the inputs. And um, let me take some time to introduce the input model that we consider. I mean, if you think about classical worst case analysis, this is like playing a game against an adversary. So you are the algorithm designer, and then you have an adversary who picks an input for your algorithm. And the algorithm wants to find an input, of course, where the algorithm takes as much time as possible. And um, somehow this adversary seems to be too powerful, since he can specify such instances which uh, do not seem to be realistic. And so we want to take some power away from the adversary. And we do this by adding some random noise to the decisions that the adversary makes. And um, in the case of the knapsack problem, uh, we consider the following model. So the adversary chooses the capacity. Uh, actually, we don't really care about the capacity since it doesn't influence the number of free to optimum solutions. Um, but okay, the adversary can choose it. And he can also choose the profit pi to pn. This is like in a worst case analysis. You can really exactly specify these numbers. Uh, but now we want to add some random noise um, in the weights. Um, and we say that the adversary chooses pi perturbed weights. And I explain in a second what that means. So when I say I have a pi perturbed number, uh, what I mean is uh, that this number is actually a random number that is determined by a certain probability density. Um, so that means uh, the adversary chooses for each i a probability density fi, and this density is defined on the interval 0 to 1, which is basically just a scaling issue. So I scale my numbers such that all the weights are between 0 and 1. And the maximum of this density is upper bounded by some parameter phi uh, that we can choose, where phi is at least 1. Um, OK, let's think a bit about this model. So what's, um, what does it mean? What is, uh, why do we have this phi? Well, actually, the phi measures in some sense how close we are to the worst case. So um, if you don't like to think about densities, you can also think about the following special case. So basically what the adversary can do, for each weight, uh, he can determine an interval of length 1 over phi. And he can set the density to phi in this interval and to 0 everywhere else, which means that um, oh I should have said before that uh, he specifies these densities. And then, of course, what happens is that the actual weights are chosen according to these densities. So wi is chosen according to fi independently of the other weights. And um, yeah, now the adversary could do, for example, this. He could specify for every weight an interval of length 1 over phi. And, uh, and he could say, let weight wi be chosen uniformly at random from this interval. 
this would be encoded by this density function. And here you see that this phi is basically controls how much power the adversary has. So when phi becomes very large, he can make this interval very small, which means the adversary can rather precisely specify all the weights. Whereas if phi is small, uh, in the extreme case we set it to one, then the only feasible density is the uniform density, which means if phi equals one, we have a classical average case analysis where all the numbers are uniformly between zero and one, whereas if phi goes to infinity, we are approaching the worst case. Uh, so. Okay, and yeah, basically by choosing this parameter phi, we can somewhat interpolate between these two measures. Um, so you might wonder, by the way, why don't we just study the average case if we want to have random inputs? But the idea is that, um, well, usually those instances that you encounter are not completely random. I mean, if you have some real world application, then usually you have some certain structure in the input. And um, that's why we don't like completely average uh, or completely random instances, not so much, since they don't resemble uh, practical instances. So we rather want to have a model where the adversary can still determine the overall structure of the input, but we just have a small amount of randomness on top of that. So and this is why we study this model. And now we would like to study the running time, or in this case, the number of free to optimal solution, uh, solutions in terms of the input size n and in terms of this parameter phi. So if there are any questions, just feel free to interrupt me at any point. Okay, and uh, the main thing that we're going to prove now is the following. In this setting where the adversary can precisely specify the capacity and the uh, profits, and where he can specify for every weight such a density function, in this case, the expected number of free to optimal solutions is bounded by a rather small polynomial. So we can prove the following. The expected size of the preo set is bounded from above by n squared phi plus one. So you see, for example, if this would be average case analysis with phi equals one, it would simply be O of n squared. And um, when phi increases, then it's very natural that this quantity has to increase as well, since we are approaching the worst case but it increases only polynomially in n and phi, which means even <coughs> if the adversary has quite a lot of power and can rather precisely specify all the numbers, even then in expectation we have just an expected polynomial number of uh, Pareto optimal mm -hmm. solutions. Or to put it differently, uh, to see a bad instance with many Pareto optimal solutions, you have to be really unlucky. Yeah? Uh, so as soon as you have a small amount of random noise in your input, then with high probability and expectation, you have just a polynomial number of free optimal solutions. And yeah, I think I will spend the rest of today's lecture on uh, proving this lemma and uh, yeah, drawing some conclusions from it. Um, okay. So the main idea of the proof is rather simple. Um, what I will do, okay, uh, first of all, the following simple observation. 
um, all solutions have a weight between 0 and n, just due to our scaling. You know, we said that every weight is at most 1. So every solution has a weight of at most n. And now I take this interval from 0 to n, and I divide it into many small subintervals. Uh, so let's say k is some parameter to be chosen later, but you can think about k as being a really large number, exponential in n, doubly exponential, whatever you like. It can be a really large number, and then we divide this interval into k subintervals. Yeah, so we define uh, for each i between 0 and k minus 1, we define the subinterval i sub i as um, the interval that starts at n times i over k and goes to n uh, times i plus 1 over k. And if you define these intervals, then each of them has a length of n over k, and they cover the whole interval from 0 from 0 to, to n. Yeah, so basically, um, the union of all these intervals is this. Um, and OK. Now I have these intervals. And now, first thing I do is uh, rather trivial. I say the expected number of free to optimal solutions that I have can be expressed as follows. I sum over all these subintervals, so I sum from 0 to k minus 1. And for each of these subintervals, I look at the expected number of free to optimal solutions in that subinterval. So I look at the expected number of solutions x from t whose weight is in the i subinterval. And this is just linearity of expectation, right? I mean, um, if I put the expectation outside the sum, then it's just a rewriting of this term. And then I can uh, put the expected value inside due to linearity of expectation. Um, and now I do something that looks on the first glance a bit strange. I say that this is roughly the following. I say that this is roughly, if I look at interval i, then I say the expected number of reader optimal solutions in that interval is roughly uh, equal to the probability that there exists a reader optimal solution in that interval. And this is only the case if k is very large. Or to put it different, if the subintervals are very small. Yeah, because due to our um, basically randomness in the weights, um, with high probability, um, basically any pair of solutions will have a certain minimal distance in terms of their weight. This distance will be exponentially small. But as I said, you can, k, you can make k really large, make it doubly exponential, and then it's really unlikely that you have um, uh, two solutions that are within the same interval. And so if k is really large, I can roughly write it like that. So um, the proof in the lecture notes that Jochen mentioned is more formal, but I think this part is not too interesting. So this is really just uh, computing the failure probability that there are two solutions that are very close together and then you see that this failure probability uh, does not really um, change the expected value much. Um, so let's assume that uh, we are at this. And now you see that we have reduced our problem of counting the expected number of free to optimal solutions to estimating for a fixed interval the probability that it contains a free to optimal solution. And um, this is something we can do. Uh, we have the following lemma that I will prove in a minute. And it says, essentially, for every interval of length epsilon, 
the probability that there exists a Frieda optimal solution P uh, from P whose weight is between C and C plus epsilon. So for every interval, this is bounded by n times pi times epsilon. And um, I will come to the proof in a minute. Let's first of all see uh, what happens if we plug this bound into the calculation below. Um, continue this. Well, here we talk about a fixed interval of length n over k. So I just plug in this bound with epsilon equals n over k. So then what I get is, yeah, yeah, n times pi times n over k. And now you see that I have k terms in the sum, so the k cancels out. That's essentially the reason why you can choose it as large as you want. It cancels out anyway. And what remains is only n squared pi. And um, this is um, what we wanted to prove. Actually, we wanted to prove uh, n squared pi plus 1, uh, but the additional 1 is due to the solution 0 to the n. So the solution 0 to the n is not counted since we looked here at the open interval, but it's in any case Frieda optimal. That's why we have to add this plus 1 in this. Uh, yeah, oh, I should have, of course, put it here as well. Okay, so you see the only thing that remains is to prove this small lemma. So what is the probability that in a certain interval there exists a Frieda optimal solution? And um, that's also not too hard to analyze. Um, so first of all, I will rephrase this event a little bit by defining a certain random variable. And intuitively, that random variable is defined in the following way. So let's say This is now not the capacity W. This is um, the value P that we care about in this lemma. Um, and now I look at uh, basically two Pareto optimal solutions. I look to the first one to the left of P, which I denote by X star. And I look at the first one to the right of P, which I denote by X hat. And then I define the following random variable, uh, lambda of P. And lambda of P denotes simply uh, basically the slack of x hat from the threshold p. Or to make it formal, I define x star as the optimal solution to the problem where the capacity is p. So look at all solutions x and p. I look at the one with maximum profit whose weight is at most p. Um, I define x hat in the following way. I look at all solutions that have a higher profit than x star. Uh, and among these solutions, I look at the one with smallest weight. Okay, so you see in this picture, I look at all solutions above of x star. I know that all these solutions must be to the right of p. Otherwise, x star would not be the optimal solution here. And I simply look at the one with minimum weight. So this way, I get this x hat. Uh, it might be, by the way, that x hat is undefined, that there is no solution that has a larger profit than x star. But um, let me not uh, deal with that case. It's just a small special case which doesn't affect the analysis, it just makes the notation a bit more complicated. So let's not deal with that and assume that x hat is defined. And then 
lambda of t is defined as um, the weight of x hat minus t. And now the main question, what's the relation between lambda and the event that we care about, that there is a Friedhoff in solution between t and t plus epsilon? So any guesses the relation is? So I claim the event we care about, there exists a freedom of optimal solution between T and T plus epsilon occurs if and only if lambda of T is at most epsilon. Yeah, so if you look at the picture, so let's say here is T plus epsilon. Then basically what you see, well, if lambda of T is at most epsilon, then the solution x hat will be in this interval, and x hat is Friedel optimal, so we have a Friedel optimal solution in that interval. And um, vice versa, if we have a Friedel optimal solution in that interval, then one of them will be x hat, and lambda of t will be at most epsilon. So we have related the event we care about to this random variable lambda of t. So you see the only thing that remains is to estimate this probability that lambda of t is at most epsilon. Okay, it might seem like um, a rather hard question since <coughs> we don't know too much about the Friedel set T. Uh, so what's the probability um, yeah, of this event? Uh, but it turns out that the proof is actually rather simple. Um, so what I will do now is I will define a set of auxiliary random variables. So basically for each index i, I will define one lambda i. And these auxiliary random variables would have the property that at least one of them coincides with lambda and that they can be analyzed easily. So um, how does that look like? So for every index i, I define a random variable lambda i. And this is based on the following two solutions. I define a solution x star i, which is the same as this one except that I care only about solutions that do not contain item i. So formally, I look at almost exactly the term as here. The only change is that I restrict myself to solutions for which x i equals zero. And I define a solution x hat i, which is also almost exactly the same definition as here, except that I only care about solutions that contain item i. Okay, and then I define lambda i in the obvious way. If you look at this, I define lambda i of t as the slack of x hat i from t. Okay, and my first claim is that there exists one index i, at least one index i, for which lambda of t equals lambda i of t. So why is that? Well, um, I claim you can just pick any 
index i with x star i equals 0 and x hat i equals 1. So if I have such an index i, um, and I know that x star does not contain item i, then this is not a restriction that, that changes it, right? Um, and same is true if I know that x hat i equals 1, I can put in this restriction without changing x hat. Um, and I'm guaranteed to have such an index i because I know that the weight of x hat is larger than the weight of x star. So since all the weights are non-negative, there must be one item that is contained in this solution, but not in that one. So this way, uh, we have achieved the first step. We know that this lambda that we want to analyze is equal to at least one of the lambda i's. And now we simply analyze the lambda i's and then we're done. So now what I care about is the probability that lambda i is between t, oh sorry, is between 0 and epsilon. And um, in order to analyze this, um, I use the principle of deferred decisions. Uh, which is my favorite tool uh, when you analyze probabilities. So I mean the following. Um, so I have these n random variables, w1 to wn, uh, but I can't handle that much randomness. So I want to take out some randomness uh, of this event. And I do this by saying that some of these random variables are already fixed. And in fact, uh, I even assume that all the random variables except for wi are already fixed. So I don't even care how they are fixed. You can even fix them adversarially or you can say I draw them randomly according to their distribution. But the important point is that I split my random um, process my random event into two phases and in the first phase uh, all these wj are revealed and wi is still left random. And now the nice thing is that with these wj you can already determine a lot of important quantities here. I claim that if these are fixed then also x star i is fixed. Because if you look into the definition there, then you see that uh, for x star i, I care only about those solutions that do not contain item i. So, and for that set, uh, the value of w i is irrelevant. So when I know all the w j, then this is enough information to determine this x star i. And if x star i is fixed, then the same is true for x hat i. Now you might say, wait a minute, um, the solutions in x hat i, they contain item i. So somehow they are influenced by w i. However, they all contain item i. So which means I can determine which of these solutions is the one with minimum weight, even without knowing w i. Yeah, so here it's important, I do not say that the weight of the solution is fixed, but the identity. I know which of these solutions is x hat i. And this is a very convenient situation, since if I now look at the random variable x i, b, 
then, okay, how was it defined? It was defined as the weight of x hat i minus t. And since the identity of this solution is clear, and I know that this solution contains item i, I can rewrite this as follows. I can say this is wi plus some constant that depends on the wj uh, yeah, minus t if you want. Uh, okay, so since I know how this solution looks like, and I know all the wj except for wi, I can yeah, basically say the contribution of all the other items is fixed, and the only thing that is really random is this wi. And now if I care about I care about the event that this is between zero and epsilon. And now this simplifies, yeah, uh, to the event that wi takes a value between, what is it, minus k plus t and minus k plus t plus epsilon. And yeah, since I fixed already all these wj, this is now a fixed interval. And it's a fixed interval of length epsilon. And now comes the only point in this whole proof where I really use how these wi are chosen. Since now I use that they are specified by densities that are bounded from above by phi. Since now I can say this interval has length epsilon, the density of wi is bounded from above by phi, so the probability that we are in that interval is at most the length of the interval times the maximum density. And now we are almost done. Now we can plug everything together. together. Now we can say the probability that lambda of t is at most epsilon is bounded from above by the probability that there exists some i for which lambda i is between 0 and epsilon. This is due to the first claim that lambda equals uh, at least one lambda i. So if lambda is at most epsilon, at least one lambda i is also at most epsilon. Um, so I estimate this simply by a union bound. So I take the sum over all i. And this is what we just estimated. This is at most epsilon phi. So I have this n times, so I get n times epsilon phi. And this is exactly what we wanted to prove. Yeah. And this shows that the expected number of free Dobson solutions is at most n squared phi plus 1. Um, and yeah, now we can, as a small corollary, say the expected running time of the nehmhauser ullmann algorithm is O of um, n cubed times pi. And this n cubed comes from the following small observation. Uh, so remember, we said that the, um, sorry, that the expected running time Um, can be expressed in terms of the sizes of these Pareto sets. Yeah, I've already used linearity of expectation. Um, uh, and basically, for each of these expected values, we put in the bound we just showed, which becomes um, i squared phi, since I have an instance with i items. This is at most n squared phi. I have this n times, so I get to this n cubed phi. Um, yeah, and so this way we have proven that we can solve these random inputs of the network problem rather efficiently. Um, maybe a couple of remarks about this. Um, I mean, this is, of course, if you look at n cubed, this is not the algorithm with which you can solve these instances with billions of items. 
I mean, if you implement that carefully, um, I think it's easy to solve instances with 1,000 items. If you want to solve instances with 10,000 items, then this is already uh, problematic in terms of memory and also in terms of running time. Um, but I think in my next presentation, I will give you a hint um, how um, basically these algorithms look like that can solve these large instances. And they use this actually as a subroutine, but they apply the Slimhauser Ullman algorithm not for the whole instance, but just for a small sub instance. So uh, this is, uh, even though this algorithm alone won't solve large instances, it's still very useful. Um, maybe some other remarks. Um, I so far talked only about the knapsack problem, but um, actually the theorem I just proved is much more general. Um, and let me write down one extension of the theorem. Um, so let's say we are given an arbitrary set S, which is a subset of 0, 1 to the n. And this encodes the feasible solutions to our problem. So for the knapsack problem, every solution was, was, was feasible in our, in our setting. So we just looked at all vectors from 0, 1 to the n. But let's say you can uh, specify some subset of feasible solutions. And let's say you have an arbitrary objective function P that assigns each of these solutions a profit. So in our setting, we had this linear objective function that assigned a profit to each solution. And now let's say we have a linear objective function W. So W is of the form that we considered and the coefficients of high perturbs. So forget about the knapsack problem. So we are just given an instance of some problem that has the following form. We are given an arbitrary set of feasible solutions. We are given an arbitrary first objective function P and we are given a linear objective function W whose coefficients are perturbed in the sense as we um, studied it for the knapsack problem. And actually one can prove that for any such setting, the expected number of Friedel optimal solutions is O of n squared <coughs> pi. And um, let me give you some natural application of this. Um, let's say, for example, take your favorite graph problem, maybe the spanning tree problem. And now look at the bicriteria version of it. So you're given a graph and every edge has maybe cos and length. And now you care about the Pareto optimal spanning trees. Uh, then what this theorem tells you is that in expectation, there's only a polynomial number. Since what you could do is you could say, well, I introduce one binary variable for each edge and then basically S denotes the set of incidence vectors of all spanning trees. And this way, yeah, so I'm basically by, by defining S, I say that I look at the spanning tree problem for a given instance, and then, yeah, I have this one objective function, uh, which is even linear in that case, and I have the other one, and so it suffices to perturb either the length or the cost of the edges, and then in expectation, yeah, you have only, uh, in this case, then M, if M denotes the number of edges, M squared times pi many Friedel optimal spanning trees. And this works for, for almost every graph problem you can think, think of. Uh, so in that sense, this is really general. And um, well, if you look into the proof, then you will realize that we have almost proven this statement. So we never explicitly used that we talked about the knapsack problem, at least um, um, well, actually, there's only one small thing in the proof where we have to make a more or less non-trivial adjustment. And the only thing is right here on top. Uh, we said that in the case of the knapsack problem, uh, we always can find an item that is not contained in x star, but that is contained in x hat. hat. And that was due to, the, um, due to the definition that all the weights are non-negative. So if you allow arbitrary, also negative weights, then you have to slightly adjust that. But that's just a minor technicality, so I think 
the main truth still goes through and we get the same result for yeah, all problems of this form. Um, yeah, you can also extend it to um, multi-dimensional problems where you have more than two objective functions and then maybe as a last remark for, for this lecture, uh, so if you're in the following setting, you have one arbitrary objective function is here and you have now D linear objective functions and uh, these are linear objective functions with five perturbed coefficients. So Um, then the expected number of greed optimal solutions becomes uh, essentially it's n squared phi to the power of d. And this is more or less tight. So in that sense, you can also extend this to multiple objective functions, but that step is, is really hard to prove. I mean, the, this proof is much, much longer and much more technical. So, um, so yeah, this is much more convenient for uh, just two objective functions. Okay, are there any questions? <laughs> yes? Uh-huh. Uh, that's tight, yeah. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, when I first saw it, I also thought that probably we lose there a lot, but uh, actually we don't. Uh, so um, you can uh, you can prove that this is tight. So so you can more or less easily construct instances where the expected number of free optimal solutions is omega n squared. Uh, so this is already the case for for average weights with phi equals one. And then if you um, uh, put in a, a bit more effort, then you can also prove that n squared phi is essentially tight. Yeah, it's, it's not so clear. I, I think, um, yeah, probably the, the proof of the lower bound will, will also carry over to this. It will probably also show that this is n cubed. And this is also what, what one observed in experiments. So seems to be rather tight, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, if, if that might additionally help if you have this lower bound or... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, mm, I don't know. It's a good question, but yeah, we didn't think about that so far. <laughs> <laughs>